Hey everyone. In this video, I want to answer the question, how do I have Azure on-premises? Um, and before we can answer that question, we really have to understand, well, what exactly are you asking? Because there are many different aspects to Azure. But first, as always, if this is useful, a like, subscribe, comment, and share would be appreciated. So I want Azure on-premises. So what is Azure? So we think about, well, we have Azure, this cloud service. And I can think, firstly, Azure is capacity. Now that capacity could be CPU, network, storage, um, various types of things. But fundamentally, Azure is offering capacity. Now, the way Azure offers that capacity, remember, is we have this great big Microsoft backbone network. And then what we have are regions. So this region is defined as this two millisecond round trip latency envelope, multiple physical facilities in that connected to that Microsoft backbone. And there are lots of these regions all throughout the world. So I have multiple regions available to me. Now, those regions offer a whole set of different capabilities, which I'll get back to in a second. Now, in, a different, in addition to what we consider kind of these major regions, one of the things we start to hear about are, well, these Azure Edge zones. And here I can think about these smaller facilities that are maybe closer to certain metro Politan sort of cities, etc., connected to that same Microsoft backbone network, uh, still Microsoft owned, but these are these Azure Edge zones that are going to offer a subset of services. And then you'll hear about, well, they're these Edge zones with carrier. So here on the carrier's network, now that carrier network does connect to the Microsoft backbone as well. But here in the carrier facilities, they're offering these kind of Microsoft services. And the benefit of these edge zones with the carriers is that carrier network is kind of one hop away from things like the 5G networks. If I was operating the same kind of 5G network and I had a super low latency to certain Azure services, well, I could use that capacity in those edge zones with the carriers to actually provide that. Now, a few times I've said services. So this is capacity. This is places where there's some capacity to run stuff. Now, the stuff I'm actually running, that capacity is exposed as services. Now, when we think about kind of the Azure regions, well, there's a whole bunch of different resource, oh, resource providers. Um, we think about very common ones like, well, there's compute, there's network, there's storage. There's a whole bunch of these that offer essentially a huge range of different services like compute. We can think about all well, VMs, VM scale sets, disks. Here we can have virtual networks. Here we can have kind of storage accounts. Huge range of these. Now, if I actually go and look in the Azure portal, we can actually take a quick look at this. So if I actually just go and search here in the portal, and I just type in Resource Explorer, by looking at that Resource Explorer, it's going to show me all of the different resource providers. And there are a huge number of them. And then as I kind of alluded to, well, I could look at something like Compute. And then here we can see on the Compute, where's well, availability sets, cloud services, disks, galleries. And if I keep scrolling down, I'll see virtual machines. Here, virtual machine scale sets. We have all these different types of service provided through those resource providers. Now, those main Azure regions, as I alluded to, well, 
there's just a huge number of those all throughout the world. So we have those capabilities that offer most of those different types of resources. Now what we're also now seeing are these kind of edge zones. Now this is preview, but here we can see certain metro areas that are coming online for edge zones offered by Microsoft. And then you're going to see edge zones with carriers. For example, AT&T right now are offering these in kind of Atlanta, Dallas, and Los Angeles. So if I think about, well, services, hey, I have the full set in these Azure regions. Now, when I start looking at things like, well, the edge zones, it's really a subset. I'm typically going to want these built around kind of IoT, uh, maybe containers on Kubernetes and kind of VM. So it's a much smaller subset, but they're the sorts of things I would really want there. Now, in addition, when we think about all those different types of services, a huge number of those I can almost think of as supporting type services. I could think about, yes, we have all these different VMs and VM scale sets and all of those great things, but there's also great supporting services I could use for many different things. Things like Azure Site Recovery for replication, things like backup, things like monitoring, um, update management. So there's a whole number of these that bring additional sets of capability that help those services actually running in there. Okay, so I have Azure can be thought of as capacity, and that capacity is exposed as services, which are available through these different means. But to actually do things, well, there's a management plane. So now I can think about, okay, we have this Azure Resource Manager, or ARM. This is the control plane of Azure. It is how I do all of my management. Now, through that Azure Resource Manager, we do basic things like CRUD operations. Create, read, update, delete. I create things, I update them, all of that stuff. On top of that, we have metadata about all of those resources. So, of course, we have things like tagging. Through those, I can do things like search. I have things like inventory. I can do things like change tracking. Then I have things like monitoring. And I alluded to that up there, but that monitoring, things like log analytics, really builds into many other types of things. We have Azure Monitor, we have kind of Azure Monitor logs, which can then go and be in, build into services like Azure Sentinel. So we take the logs, we look at the logs, we apply machine learning to that, and we can deduce things. We can spot certain types of things. We have governance requirements. So we have things like Azure Policy, so I can both track compliance and enforce things. So that's both tracking and enforcement. We have things like Azure Security Center. Um, I have things like update management, as I kind of alluded to up there as well. There's all these extensions that I can add for things like virtual machines, custom script extensions, uh, anti-malware with Defender. And one of the other nice things I get in here is kind of this managed identity that actually I can use to do RBAC to other resources. So I can kind of control those things. And so if I think really what is Azure, well, Azure is this. It's capacity with services with a control plane. And so when you ask the question, I want Azure on-premises, which bit do you care about? Do I care about I want to extend the management, the control plane of Azure to my resources, be they on-premises, be they maybe other clouds? Or do I actually want to start getting into, well, there's certain Azure services I want to be able to run on my equipment, or I want to add in additional capacity in an Azure consistent manner. 
So I have to be able to answer that question to really identify what is the right solution for me. But let's start kind of from the bottom going up. Let's say it's the management plane is what I care about. Now, if it's the management plane I care about, what the answer's really going to boil down to for this is ARC. So we have Azure ARC. And what ARC is going to do, there's different flavors of Azure ARC, but fundamentally it's extending the control plane of that Azure Resource Manager and making it available to other types of things. Now, the most simple basic unit we can think about often is, well, a virtual machine. So I could think about, hey, over here, I just have my VM. Now, that, that virtual machine, this could actually be, now I'm saying a VM. I should actually change that. I'm going to say instead an OS instance because, yes, it can absolutely be a VM, but it could also be bare metal. It could be Windows. It could be Linux. Uh, it really doesn't care. And again, I'm drawing it in green to kind of hint that, hey, this is kind of this on-premises thing. But it could also just as easily be in another cloud. It could be in AWS. It could be in uh, GCP. It really doesn't matter. Um, cloud. Now, the way this works is obviously I'm dealing with an OS instance. So what we have with Arc is we have an agent. So it's going to install on here the Arc agent. Now, this is the Azure Connected Machine agent. And again, there's version for Windows, for Linux. There's ways to do a large scale deployment of this. But once I get this Arc agent deployed, what it's basically now doing is it's going to go and check in with that Azure Resource Manager. This virtual machine now actually has kind of a little avatar, a projection of itself into my Azure subscription. So I do stand up kind of an Arc management plane in a particular subscription. So this will now light up and all my multiple VMs would now show inside there. So now this is a known entity. It's the agent goes and connects to Azure, so I'm not opening up firewall ports or anything like that. And this is in GA today. So the Arc for servers, so again, there's different flavors of this. So this is kind of Arc for servers. Now this connection, it could be over the internet. If I had Express Route, it could be over Express Route. Um, and they're working on kind of actually doing that over a private endpoint as well. Now, an important part, this is not creating OS instances today. This is, I have it there already, be it a VM or whatever. I'm putting the agent on it, and then it lights up the OS to Arc. Today, it is not creating VMs on Hyper-V or vSphere or anything like that. It has to be there already, and then it can actually take and do the management of it. Now, what we get is, well, we get things like the monitoring. Through this agent, I can now actually get the monitor. And through monitoring, I get things like, well, there's Azure Security Center. Through those logs, again, now we can send things to things like Sentinel. I can get things like App Insights. Uh, even other types of insights like SQL, I get those capabilities. We get policy. Now, the policy is primarily in guest. Um, there are some types of management policy that would apply. For example, I could say, hey, I want it to have certain tags, but primarily the policy is going to be in guest. So I can kind of think about, well, for Windows, that's going to be that desired state configuration um, set of capability. Um, for Linux, it's going to be inspect. But I mean, DSC is available for Linux as well, so I wouldn't be surprised if that changes. I can apply things like tags. Now I can search, I can do an Azure resource uh, graph, and I would find that thing. I have that kind of change management, change tracking, and my inventory. I have that available to me. I have things like the update management. 
So of all these, actually tons of capabilities, one of the most interesting ones is I also get a managed identity for that virtual machine. Now through that managed identity, I can then use that to go and talk to other services in Azure, like Key Vault. Well, Key Vault could then store things like certificates. And then the other thing I can do here is extensions. So there are certain extensions for VMs that apply to this. And there's one of them about certificate update management. So through the identity, I can get permission to a Key Vault to get the certs to apply to that OS instance. So it's actually a, a very cool kind of thing. I can bring all of this together. So this is just my OS instances, bare metal, VM, other clouds, doesn't matter. I'm putting this agent on them and then through the agent, we now light up all of these capabilities. And again, kind of some of those extensions uh, will kind of shine through on there. If I actually quickly jump over, so if I go and look at my kind of uh, environment here, one of the things I can actually see is if I go home and I'll go to my arc, there's my Azure arc, and we can see there's different types of arc. We can see there's, there's servers, there's Kubernetes, there's data services, there's Azure Stack HCI. But if I go to servers, I have, this is a Windows Server 2019 virtual machine, registered and running the agent. And we can start to see the things it has. Now it does have access control. I didn't really stress the RBAC because honestly the RBAC is more about what I can do to the object in Azure. I can't do things like change who can log on to that OS. So I think that's less of a feature today. But you'll see I can have extensions. So there are various extensions I can actually add things like that desired configuration. And there's actually a complete list. If I look at this list, it actually shows me the available extensions. So things like Defender, um, Log Analytics Agent, Key Vault, then there's ones for Linux. So we have those extensions I can now apply actually to my Arc known virtual machine to actually leverage that. I can see I can apply policies. And right now, even though I've done nothing specific, well, it's going to have things like the regular policies I've applied to my subscription, like Azure Security Center. Um, it's going to show me where I am. I could light up things like update management, inventory, change tracking. I can get my insights. There are certain tasks I can use. I can light up all these different things actually for this instance. Now, in terms of the Arc service, if I think about, well, for things just like registering it, um, for getting that tagging, the searching, that, that's free. Now, when I start to look at things like the change in inventory, um, this kind of desired state sets of capability, uh, that's where I start paying money. Also, if I was doing Defender, Defender is a, a separate kind of item, there's kind of dollars for that as well. So you need to go and check what bits of the functionality you want to use. But this is pretty significant. So if your question was, hey, I want Azure on-prem, and it was really based around, hey, I have a whole bunch of VMs, I want to start doing some management, I want to be able to run scripts, like those extensions, custom script extension is one of those. If you want to be able to search them and tag them, I can do all of that stuff. My virtual machine in here, I've got tags, and there's a certain set of kind of common tags you use, but you can have like the city, the country, data center, any tag I want, well, I can add those tags to these resources to make them really fit in with everything I'm doing. So Arc for servers might be your answer, and you can kind of stop. That might be exactly what you want. But maybe that's not exactly what you're doing. And let's kind of go over to the other side now. Maybe I'm a little bit more um, advanced. Maybe I'm getting into these more modern applications. And maybe what I'm actually doing, we're going to kind of change color here. Maybe I'm all on the container train. And what I'm using is Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is really kind of, I think, won out as that standard for the orchestrator. And that Kubernetes 
kind of management plane manages a bunch of worker nodes that actually run the containers themselves. Now, as you would expect, once again, there is the ability to light this up for Arc. Um, so this, I'm drawing it here, it's really a bunch of containers that we run in the environment. But now what I'm getting is kind of Arc, kind of for that Kubernetes, for my container environment. And once again, this adds a whole bunch of really very nice features that are going to be key to how I think about using those container environments. Now, once again, it is not deploying Kubernetes clusters. The cluster has to be there already. But also, this is not just, you might think about some AKS deployment somewhere. It's nothing like that. As long as this Kubernetes environment is CNCF standard, so that, yes, it's AKS, but it's OpenShift. There's a whole bunch. Most of them are around this it will be able to manage that Kubernetes environment. And what I can think about, well, once again, we have kind of uh, inventory. Actually, I'll do this in this color. I have my inventory. I can do things like uh, my monitoring. So my Azure Monitor for containers will apply here. I can do my standard tag, um, search, RBAC. All of that is going to apply. I can have my governance. So Azure policy for Kubernetes, guess what? That's going to work here as well. Things like the Azure Security Center is going to work to understand those environments. And maybe one of the biggest things this is going to help light up and manage is GitOps. So GitOps is based around the idea of, well, we're going to have this flux component. So that's going to get kind of deployed as well. And what we have is we have a Git repository. So I have a Git repository out here. Now, in that Git repository, it doesn't have to be GitHub, it doesn't have to be uh, Azure DevOps repos, it could be a Bitbucket, it does not matter. My point is this Git repo has a whole bunch of YAML files. So remember, YAML files are attractive because these are those declarative files. Uh, I can version control them. They're observable. I can see what's in it. I can see what's changed. And what I'm essentially going to do is, via the GitOps, configure that cluster to say, hey, I want you to go and sync with this particular repo. So now it will actually go and look. And if there's a change to that, that repo, it will pull down the updated YAML files and apply them. Now, maybe it's referencing an image. So at the same time, I can have kind of a container registry, which has got my images. And so if I'm referencing an image in that deployment file, that declarative configuration, well, it will also go and kind of pull down the image it needs to deploy those container, those pods, to my Kubernetes environment. And, and so that's really what's coming together when I think about the arc for Kubernetes. So it gives me the insight. It's a single pane of glass. I mean, that's kind of key. These environments here will show up kind of next to my AKS environments in the Azure portal. So I'm, I'm really getting this great set of single pane of glass, standard set of policy, standard monitoring inventory. It's really bringing them all together, which is likely what I want. So that was kind of the, the arc for Kubernetes side of things. But if you think about it, once I'm managing the Kubernetes environment, again, this is all still the management plane really right now. I'm still focused on this. It is not doing life cycle, life cycle management today of Kubernetes. It is not upgrading the Kubernetes environment today. It's not doing that. But now I am kind of being able to do um, configuration management of that Kubernetes. The last part of Arc is Arc for data services. So now we're crossing the line. We have, until this point, been focused on the control plane. And when we think about that control plane, the control plane really is what I interface with things like, hey, I can use the portal to interface with that. I can interface that with REST APIs. I can interface with that through PowerShell, through the CLI, in a very standard way. And I can use that 
across all of these different things. But now we're going to start going up into actual services. Now I want some of the services from Azure on premises. Well, now because Arc can manage this Kubernetes environment today, and again, this is preview as well. So this Arc for Kubernetes is in preview. And also we get Arc for data services. So once again, now through Arc, it can also deploy a SQL managed instance. And it can also deploy a kind of Postgres SQL hyperscale. They're going to be evergreen. So it's its job to take care of updating them, to take care of hey, the scaling I want to do. So now we're actually kind of with this Arc data services, now we're actually bringing down services we can leverage as part of our business functionality. Up until this point, Arc for servers, Arc for Kubernetes was around the configuration and management. Now I'm using that configuration management to now drive actually deploying things to that Kubernetes environment it's managing to actually bring true data services. So that's Arc. Now you might look at this at this point and be like, oh, that's what I wanted. Yeah, great. I've got VMs or I've got containers. That's exactly what I wanted to do. I've already got the hardware. I've got Kubernetes. Uh, I'm good. Stop talking, John. Great. Stop the video. You're good to go. But what if um, you need a bit more? What if that isn't kind of the whole answer? Um, there's actually, hey, I want some capacity or uh, I need some additional services. So the first service I'm going to think about, I'm actually going to zoom out a little bit. Let's go over here. We had Azure Stack. Now, Azure Stack was really kind of its own thing. Um, there was no other stacks around, but it's been rebranded. We now think of it as Azure Stack Hub. So I have an Azure Stack Hub. So I have Azure Stack Hub. Now an Azure Stack Hub is this kind of turnkey appliance that's delivered to you. This could come from kind of a Dell, uh, a Lenovo, um, it could be HPE, there, there are many others. But it's provided by a vendor, and I, I probably pay them money to, to get this stack. Now that stack has kind of multiple network racks. Then there's a kind of hardware lifecycle blade. So all the cabling is native, and then I get a bunch of nodes. Now the exact number varies, but it's between kind of four to 16. And these each have kind of CPU and they have storage. So there's not a separate SAN, it's kind of using a hyper-converged methodology behind the scenes. But I get this Azure Stack Hub. So I get this four to 16 nodes providing this capability. Now, what does it actually give me? Now, what it's giving me is, well, it's Azure consistent API. Now, the API version is going to lag a, a little bit behind, but it has its own kind of portals, and there's both a user, kind of the regular portal, and an admin. I have to create plans and offers that people can consume. Um, I can use REST, I can use things like PowerShell, I can use CLI, but it is a different endpoint, i.e. I am not going to portal.azure.com. It is a local endpoint for that particular Azure Stack. If I had multiple Azure Stacks, just to be very clear, each one of them is an island. I can't kind of join them together. They're each their own little island. They each have their own endpoints. Um, so if I had five uh, Azure Stack hubs, I'd have five different URLs, endpoints to go to to manage them. Um, I am doing the management. So you manage. Once a month, for example, I might go into the admin portal, pull down the latest update package, hit apply, and it will go and update the different nodes, all the different parts of um, the Azure Stack to do that. But this different local endpoint is kind of a, a big deal. It is not being managed by Azure. 
at this point, it is really not connected to Azure. It, it can be, and I'm going to talk about that, but it is its own set of management endpoints. Now, it's consistent where it has the functionality. So, it does have a number of resource providers. There's kind of a core set. And again, we can think about from a, a core set perspective, obviously, we have things like compute. So again, we can have VMs and VM scale sets. Um, it actually uses the AKS engine. So the AKS engine spits out a JSON file that then mixes with config and VMs to actually deploy kind of a Kubernetes environment. It has certain networking, so it's using software-defined networking. It has certain storage capabilities. It has Key Vault. Now, Key Vault in Azure is kind of this shared hardware. It uses host security modules. There is no HSM in, a, in an Azure Stack Hub. So this is software-based. But it, it's on your equipment. It's in your data center. Probably not such a big deal. Then there are optional resource providers. Uh, at this point, I can do things like um, the app, app service plan type features, functions, web, um, API. I can have things like event hubs. I can have um, IoT, so I can have IoT hub. I'm going to write SQL but it's kind of like a SQL broker. It's not Azure SQL database. It's really this different thing. But obviously I'm getting far more services here. I'm getting a lot more Azure consistent services. And again, it's a different endpoint, but I can use the same. So I'm doing all these portal address. And of course, a big one might be ARM templates. So if I have an ARM template creating these types of resources, I could apply that to the Azure endpoint to create the public cloud. I could deploy it to my Azure stack stack to deploy it here as well. So that's kind of one of the, the big things I'm actually getting through Azure Stack Hub is it's more services. And of course, it's capacity. So what does it do with Azure? So imagine now, okay, so we've got the public Azure. What is it doing here? Now, when I actually get the Azure Stack Hub delivered, one of the things it actually does is obviously I have subscriptions in Azure. It has to register. Because I drew the idea that, hey, I pay money for the appliance, but I, I have to pay money for the services, be it VMs or storage or app services, whatever that might be. And there's really two kind of, there's kind of pay as you go, or I can actually do this kind of per core buyout. And if I do the per core buyout, well, that actually lets me run it in a disconnected mode. So if I'm connected, I have internet connectivity, I can connect to Azure, I can do pay as you go, or I can do per core. I have a choice. If I'm running in a disconnected mode, then I have to do the per core buyout. And this is one of the very attractive things. I can run this air gapped. I can run this disconnected. So if I had a cruise ship or a, an oil rig or a submarine or something like that, this doesn't have to have connectivity. For the authentication, yes, it can use Azure AD, but I can also use things like ADFS to talk to a local identity provider. So this is the big appeal of Azure Stack Hub as well. This is the option that can run fully air-gapped. I don't have to have that connection to Azure there. So I can disconnect this. It has all those, it's all local management endpoints. And again, I just buy out the cores. So if I now think about getting Azure services, well, Azure Stack Hub gives me a huge range of those services. Um, and it's, it's building. They're adding more and more resource providers to this. But realize, so where does Arc fit into this? Well, funnily enough, there is no Arc. It is not compatible. It will break if you actually try and put Arc on a VM running on Azure Stack Hub. The only place you can use Arc is here, if you have a Kubernetes deployment. That, then I can get the Arc capability, so I can do kind of the GitOps deployment policy. But for regular VMs, cannot do it. 
So generally, it's not ARC compatible. So that's Azure Stack Hub. Hey, I buy this appliance, uh, I pay for the services, I get a whole bunch of different services available, but I'm not managing it through Azure. There is essentially no real connection. There's a few things I can do by sending some telemetry and logs up to an Azure to get insight, but it is local management endpoints. I'm doing the management. I'm having to go and download the update package and, and deploy it to the hub. Now, what I'm talking about hub, and again, remember, each one is an island. You may have heard of this thing called the Azure Modular Data Center. It's basically this gigantic shipping container. Um, so this is kind of this Azure Modular Data Center. Um, you'll hear it kind of talk about the MDC. It has kind of the, the, the kind of AC kind of controls up there. And essentially today, you can kind of think of it racks and racks of most likely hub. I just take hubs put inside that thing. It has obviously network connections, but it has this call ability if it needs to. I can't draw a satellite dish, but it can go and talk satellite. It can have external kind of power units that can go and connect up to it. That's going to be a very, very specific use case. Uh, the average company is not going to be using this thing. But it's there. Um, if I actually go and open the, the URL quickly, get a, a picture of what one of these things looks like, and um, it would not fit in my garden. But that's kind of this Azure modular data sending. You see kind of, hey, look, we've got the airflow controls in there. We've got the, the exterior powers we can have. But it's the idea that, again, in a disconnected mode, if I need it, I can have a set of consistent Azure services um, available in a, a very large scale to really augment. And it talks about, hey, look, satellite communications options that I mentioned, and really just this big thing on wheels that I can roll around. And I guess while I'm in here, just from that pricing perspective, this is kind of the, the basic price sheet. If you don't buy it out the core, you can see, hey, look, you pay a certain amount for the virtual machines, certain amount of storage, managed disks, app services, event hubs, etc. And realize the reason you're still paying that is, yes, you're paying a vendor for the physical equipment, but then you're still using Microsoft's kind of investment and research and intellectual property for the services you run on top, which is why you kind of have that uh, pay as you go. You're still using um, that part that's more than just hardware. So that's Azure Stack Hub, and that was kind of the original Azure Stack. And then there was this thing called uh, Azure Data Box Edge, uh, and it was really a, a storage gateway. Well, this is this idea of this, uh, I think it's kind of a 1U, but it's also kind of a mini PC version. And this has been rebranded. So this is now Azure Stack Edge. This also can have things like a, an FPGA, uh, it can have a GPU, I think it's this, uh, the test, tensor cores. And this is giving me a subset of the features available. Now, this is all about things like, well, I want Azure services like the IoT Edge. IoT Edge, remember, is basically containers. I can have Kubernetes. Uh, I can have VMs. So it's a subset of the services, and it can be a storage gateway. So, hey, I want to use Azure Storage. I want to be able to kind of talk to it from this local box for the workloads running at my edge. This provides an easy way to actually interface with them. So now I think of, hey, there's Azure. This is managed by Azure. So all of the management is up here. The deployments are via the Azure Management Fabric. This just extends some capacity and services into my edge network. If I near, need some maybe near um, artificial intelligence, some near processing, maybe image processing, etc. But it's purely managed through Azure. It has to be connected. I cannot run this in a disconnected scenario. It has to be connected. And I'm paying the money up here. Essentially, I'm paying Azure this per month charge to have this on my premises. So this is a nice solution if, hey, I, I do have, maybe I need some local Azure consistent set of services for the 
edge of my business, maybe in stores, uh, maybe in certain factories, and I need to run these things near really low latency, but I want it purely managed by Azure. And what's interesting is with this Kubernetes, it actually is using Arc as well. So kind of the Arc for Kubernetes is automatically just lit up when I use the Azure Stack Edge. So if I think about, hey, I've got those edge scenarios, I need this one new box with FPGA or GPUs. There's a whole set of these SKUs. There's ruggedized ones. Again, there's these mini ones. Uh, there's, there's pro SKUs, I think with different combinations of the FPGA and the GPU. Uh, this is a great solution because it's just going to appear as another target for my deployments I perform against Azure. Hey, deploy this um, to that Azure Stack Edge. And obviously, I could have multiple of them uh, on my premises. Now, one of the things I kind of drew earlier was this idea of edge zones. So the Microsoft edge zones and the edge zones with carriers. And I talked about this IoT, this Kubernetes and virtual machines. Well, that probably looks very, very familiar. And so the other thing that's actually powered by this is we actually have this ability to have Azure private edge zones. And essentially, the Azure Private Edge Zones are built on Azure Stack Edges. I can have between one and four. And then basically, I'm going to add some kind of antenna um, or other equipment, which is then going to add like an LTE or a 5G locally. So if I was in a factory and I had equipment bustling around, maybe Wi-Fi is not that great. It's not giving me the service I want. So these Azure Private Edge Zones, once again, I bring all of these services down to here, but I can also deploy things like virtual network functions. And those virtual network functions can then light up things like, hey, an LTE, a 5G service from a number of partners to give me that locally in the facility for all the equipment that connects that then leverage those services running on those boxes. So again, another type of capability that we're bringing on-prem. So again, hey, I want Azure on-premises. Well, maybe that's a solution. If it's my on-premises is a bunch of maybe stores or factories, and hey, I just need to run these workloads, but purely managed by Azure, great. Or hey, I, I need to light up a, a local LTE or 5G network, and I want to be able to talk to these types of services, great. If I just had a mass of app services or event hubs or VMs, I just wanted to run unneeded new capacity that I want to manage locally, well, then that, that would be the hub scenario. There's one more. Now, I'm not saying I, I've kind of saved the best for last, but I think I've saved maybe the most applicable to last, if you are looking for capacity as well. Because again, from a management perspective, Arc is that answer. There's also aspects of that with things like here. But what about if I do need some additional capacity? So you may have heard there's kind of a third branch of Azure Stack. And this is Azure Stack HCI, Hyper-Converged Infrastructure. And as the name kind of suggests, this is working off, I have between two and 16 nodes. Once again, they have kind of the CPU and storage locally and it's using that hyperconverged to make that storage resilient and available. Now, this is kind of the V2. There was an Azure Stack uh, HCI V1 that was just Windows Server, Hyper-V, Storage Spaces Direct, um, and Windows Admin Center. So that has, that's really still kind of the case, except what's happened now is this solution, it, it's built on Server 2019, but it now kind of has its own branch. It's kind of branched off. And this is a separate OS now you install. I, I download and install HCI. So it's using Server 2019, it's using Hyper-V and its software-defined networking stack. It's using Storage Spaces Direct, which is that ability to have the local storage and then made highly available and replicated between the nodes. And yes, it's using Windows Admin Center. Now, it is a very controlled service. So when I, I think about this, this absolutely is kind of this 
hypervisor cluster. I cannot run file and print on this thing. It is hyper a, a, a virtualization cluster only. That is its job. It is going to have VMs on that thing. The management today, the management is here. You are using Windows Admin Center. These are not Azure IaaS virtual machines from the compute resource provider. These are Hyper-V VMs. That's what you're doing here. So fundamentally, I'm going to end up with kind of, actually it's a different color. I'm going to get VMs. Now the value prop here is then I have the Arc agent put on those virtual machines. Now I do want to stress, HCI is kind of doing some other stuff as well. So if I think about, well, just zoom this out for a second. We have the idea of, well, there's Azure. So this HCI does register. So I'm going to kind of see the HCI up here. And it does more than just register. So I obviously have to pay for this thing. So this is kind of a per core, per month charge. Now, I do get 30 days free, but after that, it goes into a reduced functionality mode. It won't delete things, um, but I can't create new stuff. It's really going to lock down. I can still stop and start stuff, but I couldn't create a new virtual machine um, locally on that environment. If it's disconnected for 30 days, it will go into reduced functionality mode. So it has to kind of check in. Because if you think about the functionality, like SDN, Storage Spaces Direct, they are data center level features. I'm not paying for, buy, buy, not buying a software license. So that's where that functionality comes from. And they are kind of doing this per month service to get those features. So it has to kind of go and check in. Now, in addition, obviously there's all those other services in Azure that this is going to take advantage of. So this HCI can hook into things like Azure Site Recovery. It can hook into things like Backup. It can hook into things like Monitor, uh, Update Management. Um, that cluster, remember in Azure we have storage accounts. I can use it as a cloud witness. So it's actually going to use that to keep my kind of cluster quorum um, healthy. So Arc is absolute. So just HCI on its own is going to use those things. But I'm then going to combine HCI with Arc to get the kind of the best experience because then it's going to start hooking in to those things. Now, one of the things I can do via the Windows Admin Center today is I can actually then add AKS for HCI. Again, I'm not pushing that via Azure today. I'm in, turning that on by the Windows Admin Center. So then on top of those virtual machines, what it, it's basically giving me is a Kubernetes environment. And I, I guess we could kind of say it's an AKS, kind of. And once again, it would put the Arc agent in there. And once again, that would then have things like the Flux agent in there. So I can do get ops and pull down those configurations um, from that central point. So here, what I'm adding is capacity and then the management through Azure. Again, this is just going to get stronger and stronger. Today, the management is 95, almost to 100% via the local Windows Admin Center. I cannot deploy VMs to Azure and they're going to deploy here. These are just Hyper-V VMs today. But I think this is an investment area. This is just going to get stronger and stronger. More and more features will light up via HCI. More and more things are going to get lit up for HCI with Arc to start doing things on, I think, that control plane, both AKS and kind of the, the HCI itself in terms of provisioning and other stuff. Don't know that. That definitely seems to be where it's going. One thing to remember, though, this HCI is not giving you guest OS license rights. So if I'm running Windows Server in the VMs, I still need to go and make sure I've got Windows Server licenses. 
this, this license here, the HCI, this per core per month fee I'm paying, does not cover guest OS. You should bring your own, so kind of really remember that point so you don't get into licensing trouble. This really is kind of a bring your own license. Just to make sure uh, you don't end up getting your wrist slapped. So that, that's really kind of the, the summary. Again, this is a big investment area. This AKS deployment via the Windows Admin Center today, and I, I can upgrade it. There's a PowerShell command to upgrade it to a newer version of Kubernetes. But then the actual configuration, so I think there's two planes, the kind of the provisioning control plane, that's kind of HCI, and then the kind of data plane, the configuration plane, well, that's ARC. They're getting stronger and stronger there. There's a lot of unison between them. You even see in ARC, you see HCI. So these things are lighting up. So if I, if I was to summarize, covered a lot of stuff here in this picture. If my question is, hey, I want Azure on-premises. If what I mean by Azure is management, nothing else, that's ARC. It could be ARC for servers, it could be ARC for Kubernetes, it could be both of them. If my meaning is I want Azure management and services, well, which services? It could be the ARC data services meet your requirements. If it's really the services you want and kind of the management, or well, maybe it's the Azure Stack Edge, uh, maybe it's HCI, because these are both connected. Obviously, that HCI is a connected model as well. Obviously, HCI and these are both adding capacity. Now, I can technically build HCI on my own servers, but the vendors may not support it. There's actually vendor validated solutions for HCI you can go and buy and put in your data center. If my, I need Azure on-premise, hey, I want a whole bunch of maybe the more advanced services, I want local management, but not managed by the Azure cloud endpoint, then that's Azure Stack Hub. Again, that can run, it can, doesn't have to, that can actually run air-gapped, completely disconnected, and it gives me a whole bunch of those resource providers, but it is not managed by that public endpoint. Every hub, remember, is its own island, its own set of endpoints I would connect to, but it's consistent. I could use portal, REST, ARM templates in a consistent manner as I would deploy them to the public cloud. So that's it. Um, hopefully that answered the question, hey, I want Azure on-premises. It's for many people going to start with Arc. That's going to be the go-to. I might then add some HCI to add some capacity to that. And again, still be managed by Arc. For very specific scenarios, hey, Edge. I need some Edge compute managed by Azure. And then I think for a smaller subset where I, I maybe just need those more advanced services, but I don't want it managed actually by public cloud, maybe I need AirGAT, uh, you have Azure Stack Hub. So thank you for watching. I hope it was useful. Until next time, take care.